Uh, your favorite football team is obviously the Carolina Panthers. And therefore, we're gonna look at a game that I played last year in Charlotte. Because what am I doing next month? Going to Charlotte. See, they knew at home, you guys are slower here. Okay, and Charlotte is in your favorite state. What state is Charlotte in? Hmm. Let's see, everybody at home is like, you know, on their computer, like, what state is Charlotte in? No, nothing, nobody knows? I'll give you a hint. It's the home of the Carolina Panthers. Yeah. North Carolina? North Carolina, that was what we call a 50-50 guess. Good job. All right. Right, and the reason, we have a good reason why it's in North Carolina. Nothing's in South Carolina. So that was the good reason. The answer is never South Carolina. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go there to teach chess because I've already taught all you guys. So we gotta go teach the people over there. I actually taught a school in South Carolina. Okay, that was scary. All right, now uh, this game was played last year in the 2014 Southeastern FIDE Championship. Coincidentally, Last week was the 2015 tournament. And the guy that I beat in the last round last year, he won the tournament this year, but there was a good reason. You know what the reason was? Yeah. Because I wasn't there. Very good. Good job. All right. Somebody's paying attention. Okay. Now, this game was played in round three, I think, against Edward Liu. And I had the black pieces. And we did something this game that none of you have ever done. We got all our minor pieces out and we castled, right? Wasn't that strange? Yeah. That's what you should do every game. Okay, so we started out playing a Slav defense. That's called the Slav defense. And in this position, grandmasters play three different moves. They play the move that I played. They also play E6, which is called the semi-Slav, and they played A6, okay, and actually, I've played all of those moves, but not at the same time. So I usually play the Slav, so I took. Notice that black is a pawn ahead. Hooray. Okay, and if I get a chance, I'm going to defend my pawn, and I'll be a pawn ahead forever. But he didn't let me do that, because he's mean. He played a4. Now if I do that, he just starts taking me. Now he wants to play in the center with e4, but I didn't let him do that. No, I'm kidding, I did. So I could play bishop f5, that's what I usually do. But this game I played e6, and he played e3 attacking my pawn, and I can't really defend it. So I played c5, and we traded a lot of pawns, and we got our pieces out. Okay, now in this position, white has three pieces out, and black has three pieces out. White castled, did black castle yet? No, boo. Also, white's bishop has lots and lots of squares to go to. My bishop doesn't have very many. Okay, so white has those two advantages. White's bishop has a lot of squares and mine doesn't. And white castle, but I didn't. However, white has a disadvantage. If you look at the pawn structure, my pawns are all together, right? They're all next to each other. Is that pawn next to one of his pawns? No. And what do we call that? I, you. An isolated pawn. I'm going to go take that pawn later. Well, I'll try to. Okay. So he got his last piece out, and I castled, and he put his rook in the middle. Now I got to figure out what to do with this guy. Now when I watch you guys play, you guys move the same knight every move until your arm hurts, then you move some other piece. Okay, but when masters play, we move all of our pieces. So like this guy, he moved all of his minor pieces and he castled. I moved most of my minor pieces and I castled, but I still didn't move my bishop. Normally, I would play b6 and put my bishop on b7. But I was afraid because my knight's not defended. So instead I played bishop d7. And I still want my bishop on this diagonal it's just I did it a different way. And my opponent played queen e2. And now, how do I put my bishop on this diagonal? Did I take my own knight? No. Why not? Because you can. Right, but what if I could? That would be good, right? Okay, so I did what you said. Because I predicted you would say that a year ago. 
Okay, now in some of these positions, but not this one, this pawn's on a2, and my opponent can play a3, and I can't do that. But his pawn's on a4, so my knight can go here forever. His, he can never attack my knight. This pawn's gone, and this pawn's all the way up here. So that knight can sit there forever, and he can't, do, he can't go to those squares because I'll take him. What a great knight. Okay, so he played rook to d1, his rooks are in the middle, and I played like you said, bishop c6. Now my bishop's really good. Hooray. Also, all my pieces are pretty good. Okay, so if you have a chess computer at home, a chess engine, and you put this position in, it'll say it's about equal. Okay, and then whoever plays better will win, hopefully. Okay, unless my opponent plays better, then hopefully he'll blunder. Okay, and my opponent played knight to e5 because he wants to come get me. And I played knight to d5 because if we trade all the pieces, he won't come get me. And in this position, white's pieces are more active. How do we know? Well, let's pretend this is the middle of the board because that's the middle of the board. And if we look at the middle of the board, the fourth and the fifth row, my opponent has three pieces and I have one. So my opponent's crushing me and I'm defending, okay? Right, but if we trade all the pieces off, how's he gonna crush me, with no pieces? So I played knight to d5, now all the pieces can take each other, okay? Like, these pieces can take each other, these pieces can take each other, this can take this, this can take this, this is protected twice, this is protected so many times I can't even count that high. I think it's protected four times, yeah. So we're gonna start trading all the pieces off and then he won't be able to attack me because he'll have no pieces, okay? And that's what happened. He took my bishop, I took his bishop, and he said, I don't wanna trade pieces and he played b3. b3 doesn't really do anything but it protects this pawn which was already protected. But now it's protected more, okay. Right, and I played rook in the middle, and he played knight in the middle, and I played bishop back to safety. Eventually he'll take my bishop, but not now. And he played knight here. So now, once again, he has three pieces in the middle, and I have two, which is more than one. But I still wanna trade pieces so he doesn't crush me. And I played knight c6, and I said, hey, let's trade pieces. And he said, no, we're not gonna trade pieces. And in fact, his move trades all the pieces. So that was good for me. So I took his knight, he took my knight, I took his bishop, and he took my bishop. Now, one of the reasons I'm showing this game, other than the fact that I'm going to Charlotte, and this game was played in Charlotte, and Charlotte's 14 and 0, they're playing Atlanta right now, Although, as far as you know, they played Atlanta three or four days ago. The main reason I'm showing this game is because of the name of this class. Chess for, Chess for Knights, and we each got a knight, okay? And one of the knights is getting attacked, and one of the knights is doing the attacking. Okay, now, normally when I teach chess to beginners, if they see doubled pawns, they start crying. They're like, I don't like doubled pawns. Okay, double pawns and where pawns are lined up on the same line. And they don't like that, okay? And that's true, double pawns sometimes aren't very good, okay? And again, my pawn structure is perfect. My pawns are all next to each other, his pawns not, not as much. Now let's go back half a move so I can show you a trick, because tricks are for kids. In this position, remember my opponent took with a pawn? Some of you were thinking, Hmm, why didn't he take with a queen? Now, his pawns are perfect. What's wrong with that guy? Why did he take with a pawn? And actually, there's an answer. And if you know about chess for knights, you'll figure it out. Chess for knights. For, for knights. Oh. You! Uh, you can move the knight to c7. Your knight to c7. I could retreat my knight to c7. Then, then his queen would take my pawn and I would cry. Yeah, but he'd move his queen, take my pawn, and i cry. Then you take his one. Then he takes back, oh, then I win his knight. Yeah, that guy's got a point. So after knight c7, he would have to defend his knight. Then if I take his rook, he takes my rook. 
Or we could play like me and lose a knight for nothing, which is good because this is chess for knights. Okay. So knight c7 is a good move, but I played even better. But you're two thirds correct. That's a very high percentage. How can you be two thirds? We're going to find out in a second. Knight to c3. Knight to c3. You said knight to c7. That's two thirds correct. Okay. So knight to c3, and that's called a spoon. I mean a knife. I mean chopsticks. Wait, what's that called? A fork. A skewer. Wait, let's listen. Let's listen to you. What do you say? He's the closest to the board, so he's right. Shh. Who's the quietest? Now, some of you are confused. Some of you, because the rook can take the knight. Okay, but the only free knight around here is at the Chase Park Plaza. That's the only free knight I want. Now, rook takes rook, and white is in trouble. Half of you think it's checkmate, half of, half of them, but queen here, and white's doing great. Incredible. No, white's, white's doing terrible. Okay, so my opponent didn't want that to happen, so he took with a pawn, and when he takes with a pawn, if I play knight c3 again, now his queen's protecting his rook, because his queen's not on b5 over here. So did I play knight c3, giving my knight away? Yeah. I should have, because it's chess for knights. But I didn't know about this class then. This class didn't exist then. It was called something else. So I played knight f4, attacking his queen, and he didn't want me to take his queen. So he moved his queen. Okay, And he played queen e3, but he had a good reason to play queen e3, because his rook is overworked. It's defending his knight, and it's defending his rook. So he was like, man, if the guy takes my rook, then he'll take my knight. So he defended his knight again. Now his knight's defended. Twice. Okay. Now the game gets really tricky and complicated, which is good because the name of this class is Chess for Tricky and Complicated. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Probably next year, right? We've got to have a new name for the class. Okay. So now I wasn't sure how I should win. I was like, this guy has messed up pawns, although I like checkmating his king too. What a tough decision. Should I checkmate him or take a pawn? Take a pawn. Obviously checkmate him. Yeah, somebody in the class said take a pawn. Right. So I was like, why can't I do both? Okay. Professional athletes always wanting more. Okay. So I played rook takes rook check. I can't believe he found the best move. Can you believe it? Yeah. Okay. How many legal moves does White have? How many possible moves? Um, I don't know. A million. Yeah, Incorrect. Yeah, million. You with the right answer. No. Two. He can take Rook takes Rook, or he can play Queen E1. Also good. No, Queen E1's terrible. So he played Rook takes Rook. Okay. Now. You said illegal moves. Legal, not illegal. Now you gotta get get the wax out of your ears. All right. Now, I played rook to d8, and he made the losing move. Now, I like rook to d8 because this is attacked, and this is attacked, and this is attacked, and this is attacked. That causes the most confusion. Now, some of you are confused because you're like, wait a minute. He takes your rook, and he takes your knight. Why would you give your knight away? Why did I give my knight away? Because I want to checkmate him in St. Louis, even though it's in Charlotte. Okay, And so he was like, wait a minute, that's checkmate. I don't like that. So what he should do, well, he should do that, except not take my knight. So instead, he made the losing move because it was too complicated for him. He played rook c1, or he went backwards. How do you go backwards? Okay, played rook c1, bam. And I think the best move is rook a1. And I think rook takes rook is the second best move. But I haven't analyzed this game in a year. He thought that was the safest move. He was like, I'm defending my knight. I'm defending my knight again. I'm stopping checkmate with my rook. And I'm threatening his knight. He thought he had everything. He thought he was all set. Now, when you watch a grandmaster game between two grandmasters, usually it looks really boring. They trade all the pieces, and they agree to a draw. 
and then everybody falls asleep. For example, in the Qatar Open, which is taking place now, on the top nine boards, there were eight draws, and one person won. And the person who won, he gets to play Carlson tomorrow. That'll show him, teach him to win. Okay, he gets a tough pairing. Okay, so those guys, it looks like this. They trade all the pieces and they draw. Okay, but this guy wasn't a grandmaster, so he made a bad move. He thought he was playing safe, but actually he lined his pieces up where they could get in trouble. If you have a piece over there and a piece over there, it's hard to fork them. It's hard to attack them both. But if they're lined up, up and down, sideways, or diagonal, now you can fork those pieces. Okay? And so when he played Rook C1, notice how he lined up his pieces on the diagonal. Also, he did something you should never do in chess or in real life. He walked into a fork. That hurts. Okay? That's why we're in this room. If you were in that room, you'd be walking into forks all the time. Okay, lots of forks in that room. And if my knight goes to e2, that would fork his king and rook. But if he played rook to a1, there's no way my knight's going to fork his king and rook. So rook c1 was the losing move. How did I punish my opponent on the diagonal? How can I put a diagonal piece on that diagonal? Mm, you with the right answer. No, that's right. That is right. He doesn't know. You don't know the answer. You said you didn't know, so you're right. You with the right answer. Queen G5. Now, my queen's lined up with his queen and rook. But I have a more important threat, a threat only you can see. Yeah. Um, uh, knight to e2. That's the complicated threat, not the simple threat. The apocalypse. That's half right. You with the really right answer. Queen g2. Right. Queen g2, checkmate with advantage. Oh, I know. Right. And this is the two o'clock class, so somebody should have got that. Not just you, like most of the class. Okay. Now, my opponent didn't want to get checkmated because then I win. If he plays queen g3, that would show him who the boss is, not him. Then he loses all of his pieces. Man, I, I win so many pieces, I'm confused. Okay, so he didn't do that. Right, so now the computer says, no laughing, the computer says the best move for white is queen takes knight. That's the best. Okay, that means his game's not very good. So the computer's like, man, now white's losing a queen. Terrible. Okay, if you're at home, put this on your computer. It'll say plus a trillion. Okay, it really likes black's position. Okay, now let's say you don't want to give up your queen, but you still want to stop checkmate. What do you do? But you don't want to give your queen away. G3. Okay, my opponent, what did he do? Okay, he resigned. He gave up. No, he, he, he did. Okay, let's pretend he played g3. Now you, or you, somebody, you I think, gave the right answer. What does black do here? Knight e2 check. That's an x-ray, a fork, and a skewer plus tax. What's an x-ray? Yeah, what's an x-ray? That's when you attack or defend a piece through another piece. That's an x-ray. So my queen is attacking his rook through his queen. Because if his queen takes my knight, now I take all of his pieces. Queen takes rook, check, and queen takes knight. Where do all his pieces go? On the side of the board, where Mike Cummer likes to look. Okay. Right. Now if he moves his king, because he's in check, so that would be a way out of check, then I could trade queens and then a free rook. So either way, I'm up a rook. Now, he could also protect checkmate. He doesn't have to play g3. He could play queen f3. That protects checkmate. Now what would I do? He stopped checkmate. 
There's like five good answers. You. That was what I would do, but other like knight g2 wins, knight h3 wins. Yeah. Okay, but I'm not saying you're, I would I would have played knight e2. Yeah. Knight e2 check. Yum 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 yum. And now, do I play rook d1, winning his queen and checkmating him, or queen takes knight with an extra rook? No. Okay. That's not really a Sophie's choice there. All right. So he was like, hmm, g3 loses, queen g3 loses, queen f3 loses. Uh-oh. Because now he realized knight e2 check. And he walked into knight e2 check because he played rook c1. If his rook was on some other square, like a1, I don't have any of those tricks. You rook c1, the only bad move. What does that game teach you? Teach you something important. When you're playing chess and you lose or you win, it doesn't mean, let's say you lost. It doesn't mean you played all bad moves and your opponent played all good moves. It's possible. But more likely, the position was about equal, like this one. Then the guy makes one really bad move, like that, like that one, rook c1. And then after this, he's like, oh no, rook c1, can I take that back? You know Preston? So several years ago, one of our chess club members was playing in a tournament against another chess club member, and he made a move, and he hit the timer, and then he was like, oh no. And he said, can I take that move back? What was the answer? No. No. no that was way. Preston versus Matt Larson. <laughs> yeah, you can guess who did what to whom. Yeah, you have to edit out all your laughing. Right. So when you make a bad move in chess, and then you let go, you, you can't say, oh no, that was terrible, that's too, too late. So instead, you should look nonchalant. When you blunder all your pieces, just look confident like I played great. If you're like, oh no, your opponent will see what you did wrong. So because of the back rank issues of checkmate, because of his rook hanging, because of the fork, and because of the checkmate, he gave up. This knight was doing nothing. That knight was silly. Now if we go back, if he played rook a1, a better move, you might even take my pawn later, who knows. And I threaten checkmate, and he stops checkmate, I can't be forking his king and rook, because there's no rook there. So if I check, he just take me and laugh. So the losing move was rook c1, that walked into a forked, and it walked into an x-ray. Okay? And actually, that happened to me last month at the doctor. They did an x-ray and they found a fork inside. Okay? And I thought it was because I ate too quickly, but it was actually a knight, a king, and a rook inside me. I was hungry, so I ate them. And they, they made a fork, right? Yeah. yeah, that kid agrees. All right, now, after that chess for knights with all my great knight moves, now you can play each other, but make sure you do a lot of knight forks. <laughs>